So this was a gentleman who was seen, a 39-year-old man who had decrease in vision uh, in the right eye. Uh, he has uh, many medical issues as well, but uh, his vision was uh, quite good in general, but he had a visual field deficit. And when we saw him, uh, he had, this was his right eye, and you can see the visual field deficit over here, and the left eye was uh, normal. And this is a beautiful photograph that shows uh, a giant retinal tear uh, in his right eye. You can see the extent of the tear that extends to almost about 180 degrees. And it's interesting, as you can imagine, Rishi, you know, he just thought uh, uh, there was really not a whole lot wrong with him because his central acuity was still 2020, uh, but he had this visual field deficit. So... You can see on the OCT, uh, here's the uh, macula. You can see all of this pigment uh, in his eye, and he also had some uh, blood in the eye as well. Yeah, so, this, this pigment that, you're seeing on the imaging, tell me more about this, because this is something I don't think I've seen. So this, is this truly the tobacco dust sign? You're yeah, seeing and, and he also had some hemorrhage, vitreous hemorrhage as well. Okay. So kind of a combination. And as I'll tell you about his history, you know, he was uh, uh, being seen somewhere else for about a month before he was sent to see us. And there's some social th issues that why he was seen that way. So this happened about a month ago. Uh, he was hospitalized with a chest tube. So we actually saw him with an effusion with an empyema in the hospital at CPMC. There were significant social barriers to follow up. And at this point, so this is probably the reach of the first time in my life I've done surgery on a guy with bilateral chest tubes and we're quite uh, fortunate to have really good anesthesia who said, yep, no issues, we'll put this guy to sleep and you know, you do what we need to do. So one of the approaches we thought, okay, when do we put this uh, surgery? When, how do we do it and so on and so forth? And we also knew as social barriers, he said he's never coming back. So uh, he, he basically told us that his follow-up, this is, was gonna be it, uh, whatever we do. So we did a vitrectomy uh, with a sclerobuckle, kind of a typical procedure for this gentleman, a 41 band. Uh, and then we did uh, perfluorocarbon and we gave him positioning instructions. And I will show you kind of what we did intraoperatively. So this is us uh, putting the vitrector uh, instruments in. The band uh, vitrectomy has already been done. Now, as you can imagine, that we're removing the hyloid in this patient, and he was not an easy guy to get the hyloid off, but uh, because he was not uh, totally attached or detached the hyloid. Um, now we're doing vitreous based dissection, and kind of what made it difficult for him is, you know, faking patients. You, it's difficult to do this, uh, especially in somebody whose positioning in a intraoperative was difficult because of his chest tubes, his head position. So now we're kind of marking the edges of the break, as you can see, and I don't like to treat, I don't like to mark and over uh, these, uh, uh, the retina either. And this retina had been sort of been folded onto itself almost for a month. So we can kind of, it was almost sort of stuck together. Uh, but luckily for us, uh, we were able to uh, uh, get a good dissection and then using prothorocarbon, uh, using the dual bore cannula just allows us to get uh, venting to maintain the intraocular pressure. We don't have any, really any small bubbles because one of the things we always worry about, as you know, is subretinal PFO in these cases. So we try to avoid that as possible. And you can see kind of the color change uh, in the retina because the retina had been folded over. Uh, and again, his visualization wasn't great because he had some corneal issues as well. Uh, but now we're kind of lasering in the area of the GRT. And this is under perfluorocarbon. And as after we're done lasering, we leave the perfluorocarbon in the eye. And then I come back a week later because we knew the guy was going to be in the hospital. And obviously, he didn't position in any position. Uh, so now we take out the perfluorocarbon a week later. Uh, and I this is not my go-to technique. I don't typically use long-acting tamponades or oil in patients with uh, uh, GRTs. Uh, I do uh, perfluorocarbon for a week, then an air fluid exchange, and then more laser to the anterior aspect of the break. Now, this is a nice little trick that I learned uh, is to get that last little bit of PFO, uh, put a little bit of BSS, and it comes pretty easily. Otherwise, you're always afraid of hitting the retina. And this is just all under passive uh, extrusion. So once I sort of do this, uh, have additional laser to the anterior margin uh, uh, for this gentleman, and he still has a chest tube uh, at this time. Um, so 
once we're done with this, he basically gets filled with uh, air, uh, no long acting temp. And I remember he was 20 20, uh, his visual acuity. And then once we see him in follow up, as you can see, that a week later, uh, this is uh, what he looks like. And this is post operatively. And this is at his last follow up. We never saw him back. But vision was 20 30, uh, pressure was nine. He had about a 25% air bubble. And so this has sort of been my go-to technique where, I don't know, I'd be interested to see how you do GRTs, but you know, I used to do a PFO oil exchange and leave these patients with oil. But I just think once you put oil into an eye, it's, it, it's just not the same. And this is what it was, as a 2020 eye. And um, I don't know, I'm kind of curious to see what, 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 what your thoughts are. Yeah, it's a great case and a fantastic outcome. A couple kind of comments. Um, the question about buckles, I think, has always been a lifelong question in GRT surgery. And I, I think I, I agree with you as far as phacic individuals where you can be not assured that you're going to get all the highlight out. And the buckle allows for that additional imbrication effect, which you know prevents, potentially prevents retinal attachment. So I think that's a good add for a phacic individual. For a pseudic phacic individual, you could argue that a maybe a buckle may not be wholly necessary. And so I might do that in those cases where the, that is the situation. Um, the other question I think that comes up in these cases is the way we use um, the how you did, which was, I think, a, a great method of sort of dissecting the vitreous space. I use a, a similar technique, but I do infuse PFO as soon as the core vitrectomy is done and I realize, that, realize the hyaloid is up centrally. And I, what I do is I put a little PFO bubble down go back down, take the micro bit, then keep aggressing myself to the retinal periphery, keep infusing a little bit of PFO each time. That allows me sort of a second hand. So I'm pushing the retina down. I'm sort of shaving above it so I can kind of see that interface between the PFO and the gel. Okay. And therefore, you don't lose that. And that, I think, is a, an, another way to do some of a similar way to what you did. Um, and the last piece, I think, well, I, I love this technique. Uh, I haven't done this technique. I typically had done long acting gas and just hoped uh, the patient did well and waited for the gas to kind of regress and resolve. And thankfully, many of them did well. But I think to your point, um, you know, I, I, I think uh, the, the other opportunity is to put the way you did and put the PFO down and come back a week later. I think, especially given the positioning aspect of this patient, that was ultimately what you needed to do. And I'm glad to see that that's an option. Um, I, you know, again, in, in my typical surgery, I would have done a gas bubble and then realized, as you did, uh, that this patient is probably the not, not the greatest positioner because the bilateral chest tubes, right? So, so how do you go overcome that? And I think you overcame that in a really, really great way here without putting oil in the eye, which can be sometimes damaging to the eye over time. Well, I, I think two things, Rishi. I think one is that uh, we, we knew this guy's probably not going to come back, right? Number two, we knew that he was going to be a hospital. Right. He, he was not going to leave AMA with a chest tube. So we knew that we would, one of the dangers is you leave PFO in the eye and then they don't come back. So th that's that danger. But this danger was something that if, if I would have put oil in, he would have required a second surgery anyway. If, if, if uh, ideally, obviously, you know, if there was a superior problem, I would have just said, let's use a gas bubble and be done with it. Right. But given his issues, to me, now this is kind of becoming my technique of choice because a lot of GRTs, I would say vast majority that we see, I end up using silicone oil in these eyes. And I, I do think that positioning patients is not easy. It's not easy for us to position. A lot of people fly, travel, and all these things. So it's not that easy. And, and I think in general for retina surgery, I think we need to decrease the morbidity from surgery. You know, we, we, you know, with orthopedic docs, they just say, you know, just stay off your leg for six weeks. So it's not that easy. And, and I think this technique sort of has allowed me to, to, to give patients an opportunity to still be functional, uh, knowing that they must come back. And, and going to your other point, I agree with the, about buckles. The buckle is not to prevent the retina from redetaching at that point. It's really redetaching afterwards because we know PVR is a huge issue in these eyes. So, you know, I, we all evolve as surgeons, and um, I, I do think it's important for fellows to know how to do a silicone oil PFO exchange and use all these things. But this is kind of simplified for me uh, what I do. And the other thing I wanted to sort of, you know, we, we kind of talked about the slippage and all these things and leaving PFO. There's just some photographs. But this intravitreal methotrexate for PVR, you know, this has been published. 
And, and I have been a big fan of, of, of using this now in high risk eyes with multiple breaks, vitreous hemorrhages, PVR in the other eye is really putting methotrexate in the infusion and then giving these patients methotrexate injections every two weeks rather than every week. I think that might be too much because they don't really have PVR. But methotrexate, you know, is is not a not a uh, you know, it's fairly inexpensive, and we don't really have anything with PVR. And I think once PVR, Rishi, as you know, occurs, kind of the game becomes difficult to fight. So I'm kind of curious if you use methotrexate in high risk guys who don't have PVR. Yeah, I have not, and I, I again, I I cite the studies that are out there. There are some studies that are showing decreased. Uh, incidences of PVR. There are not a lot of great randomized studies out there. I know there was a company started by Dean Elliott or somebody in that realm that was trying to look at that. They weren't able to get FDA approval ultimately for what they were trying to show. Yes. Maybe they'll have another opportunity at a later date, but but I, I don't use it right now. I think it comes down from my aspect of things back to the basics, right? So why does PVR form in the first place? Well, you have to remove the scaffolding, which is the vitreous space. You have to make sure that you definitely treat all the retinal breaks who don't have a redetachment because that's the biggest risk factor for that as well. And there's some aspects you can't change. High myopia can't change, but you can certainly address the first two, which I think are very, very big. And so that would be my kind of focus is trying to make sure I address that as much as possible in these cases. Yeah, exactly. And again, I I think the methotrex said, and you know, we were in the guard study, and those were eyes that already had PVR. I think sometimes maybe it might be worthwhile uh, to think about. Uh, obviously, as you know, it's always difficult to do randomized trials with different surgeons. The techniques are different. You know, everybody's approach is different. But I do think this is something to think about, uh, in especially high-risk guys. And I think of high-risk guys as uh, patients who have multiple tears, vitreous hemorrhages, and GRT. So okay. lo lo lots of always interesting things to discuss. Uh, but... Uh, uh, always appreciate uh, 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 everybody's time uh, for uh, looking at these cases.